The test is not until, it's not the week we come back, the week after that. So we have plenty of time. Um, we also have like three review days built in, partially because the week we come back, things are crazy. Um, Monday's normal. Tuesday is an odd block day. Wednesday is PSAT slash late arrival for you guys. Um, I think 1030 you have a senior meeting. And it's not one of those senior meetings where they're like just trying to get you on campus for attendance and you're going to be like, eh, I'll go to Waffle House instead. Like it's the senior meeting about um, buying your graduation stuff. So you, you definitely want to go to that senior meeting so you get your packet and hear all the, all the stuff about um, graduation, <laughs> which I guess at this point seems a long way off, but you're almost there, big picture wise anyway. Um, so I think I will see, no, I won't see you that day because this is only second period. So I will not see you guys on Wednesday. Um, I won't see you Tuesday either. Thursday I'll see you uh, on a block day. And again, the good news is we have three review days built in because I knew that that week was going to be kind of weird. And so likely something gets pushed to Friday and we'll still have two review days. But we won't be pushed for time um, because I built it in knowing that week was kind of crazy. There's n there is late arrival on Thursday next week or two weeks, so you guys will get late arrival Wednesday and Thursday. Yeah, 10:30 Wednesday. I think it's 10:30 on Wednesday, and then whatever 9:25 on Thursday. Okay, let's look at um, the next page of the notes. Function analysis. We're going to go through a lot of pages today. But again, it's a whole lot of already type stuff, not a lot of stuff for you to write down. And I think this is a heavy concept day, not a heavy mechanics of taking a derivative day. So if you understand, today goes quick. And for most of you, it's going to be like, yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. That makes sense. And we're going to make some connections, I hope. All right, first of all, the basics of reading a graph. Always read a graph from left to right, right? Just like you read a book, left to right. So when I say, is the function, does the function go from positive to negative, what we're asking is, as x is increasing, does the y value change from positive to negative? So like right there, the function changes from positive to negative, because implied in that is reading left to right. We're reading left to right. <coughs> The other part about reading left to right is something like this. On the left end over here, is that is the function increasing or decreasing? Read it left to right. Is it increasing or decreasing? Increasing, right? So that one's kind of tricky because like, oh, the arrow is pointing down. Like, yes, but as you travel left to right on that arrow, you're going up the graph. You are increasing. So that's, that's sort of the confusing part is, especially if we, if we toss an arrow on there to make you think it's decreasing. As you move left to right, that's increasing. Only consider the domain of the given function. That's kind of, yeah, you don't have to worry about that. Um, the graph below is, cons is assumed to continue forever in both directions because there aren't designated endpoints. The lack of arrows, so you don't have to worry about the arrows. In, if we want it to end, we'll have to say something like, it only goes from A to B, or negative 10 to 10, or whatever. So you don't worry about there not being arrows at the end. It doesn't mean that it stops there. OK, as x moves to the right, if the function is going up, the function is said to be, that's what someone said last period. But it's not, the answer is not positive, OK? As we move to the right, if the function is going up, that function is going up as we move to the right, but it's not positive. Increasing. You answered before you let me give you the, uh, the word bank. But saying positive for that is a very common mistake. And we're going to have to be super careful, especially once we toss second derivative in there as well. Like, First derivative positive, what does that mean? Second derivative positive, what's that mean? Increasing versus positive, we'll get there. As x moves to the right, if the function is going down, 
the function is said to be decreasing. Highlight the above graph in, so like this is a blank for a color, so you pick your own color. Um, I've got two, I'm going to use green and yellow. Would anyone like to borrow a... Relative extrema visually. This is pretty easy because visually, meaning like just look at it. There is an interval, a neighborhood, around the point A comma F of A. So we're still looking at that same graph up here. There's a neighborhood around that point at which F of A is the largest value. Right? So, I mean, maybe it's a small neighborhood. Maybe it's a big neighborhood. Like, there's, a, there's quite a big neighborhood where he is the largest value. But there is some, there is some neighborhood where he's the tallest, where he's the, the highest peak. <coughs> Peaks and valleys here. This makes F have a, so here's our calculus term, relative maximum. relative maximum, meaning relative to the people around him, he's the maximum value. Maybe there are some other mountains elsewhere that are higher, but in his neighborhood, he's the maximum. The value is the y value, f of a, and the x value is a. Be careful how the questions are asked. Sometimes they're worded to where they want the y value. Sometimes they're worded to want the x value. So be careful about, is it the value or is it the location? The location is the x. The value is the y. Um, sometimes you can sneak your way around that if you just give the ordered pair. Right? You're like, I'm not sure what they're asking. I'll just give the ordered pair and answer, answer both. And a lot of times that will work. Um, sometimes it doesn't work is if I make it a multiple choice test and I make the x value one of the answers and the y value one of the answers. But other than that, as long as you give the ordered pair, you'd be okay. Another phrase for relative maximum is local maximum. Like local to his neighborhood, he's the maximum. May not be the tallest maximum, but locally, he's the biggest deal. <coughs> there is an interval around point B, B comma F of B, at which F of B is the smallest value. So now we're talking about the valley. So peaks and valleys. That makes F have a, well, you guys are smart people, relative, um, what's the parallel structure here, relative minimum. F a relative minimum of, again, the, the y value is the value, f of b. The x value is the location. Another phrase for this is local minimum. So we use relative and local uh, interchangeably. It means <coughs> the same thing. Relative minimum, local minimum. Um, point C. So point C is a little bit different, right, because it's pointy rather than smooth. But is it a peak or valley? Is it a relative minimum? Oh, I meant to label these. Point A is a relative max. Point B is a relative min. Point C... It's a cusp. It is a cusp. But our definition is, is it the lowest point in its neighborhood? Yes. Yeah, so it's it's a relative minimum. It, it feels sort of different than the other relative minimum because it's a cusp rather than smooth. So you're right to be curious about what is going on there. But it is a relative minimum. So yes, that's a relative minimum. Can a corner, a cusp, be a relative max or min? Yes, we just saw one. And you're again right to be concerned that something different is going on there. 
relative extrema, that's just the collection of both the maxes and the mins. And so really it's just a shortcut. Instead of me saying find the maxes and mins, I can say find the extrema, and it saves me time. All right, critical numbers. Again, we're doing several pages of notes today, but they're all they're all connected. <coughs> Consider this graph. You see it's the same graph we were just looking at. How many relative maximums does F have on that interval? And by the way, the endpoints don't count because they're not the top of a mountain. You don't know what the other side is. Maybe it's going down, maybe it keeps going up. You don't know, so it's not a relative max. So what do you think? How many relative maxes does that graph have? One, two, three, four. And how many relative minimums? Five. So you're just looking for peaks and valleys. Peaks are the maxes, valleys are the mins. It's like there's got to be a way to shorten these notes because of course that's true. Um, but what can you say about the derivative of f at each location of a relative extrema? The derivative. Okay, derivative is the slope of a tangent line. So let's draw the slopes on here. Tell me if you pick up on a pattern here. What are all those slopes equal to? dy dx equals? What's the slope of a horizontal line? Zero. Um, I say that. I casually skipped over this guy. You sort of already mentioned this. What's the dy dx there? Undefined. That doesn't have a, a, a slope. It doesn't have a derivative. <coughs> so at each location of a relative extrema, f prime is either 0 or undefined. That's what a critical number is. Critical numbers of a function are all values at which f prime equals 0 or f prime undefined. We're going to do this so often that you're, you're never going to forget the f prime equals 0 because that's usually what happens. Um, what happens is people forget to look for the undefined because it doesn't happen all the time and so people forget to look for it. First example. Um, you know what? Let's let me back up a second. These are all the candidates for the locations of the relative extrema. It's uh, it's kind of a squares and rectangles deal. Like when we get our pool of critical numbers, all of our relative extrema are critical numbers, but not all critical numbers are relative extrema. Right? Do you know what I mean by the squares and rectangles issue? Like all squares are rectangles, but not all rectangles are squares. And so the deal is we can find critical numbers. That's where f prime is 0 or f prime is undefined. That's sort of where we are right now. In a few minutes, we'll talk about, well, how do I know if they're if the critical numbers are also relative extrema. What we're getting there. Let's focus on the critical numbers first. Find all the critical numbers for um, this function. Okay, critical numbers, that means g prime is 0 or g prime is undefined. So what do you think we should find first if we want to know where g prime is 0 or undefined? Okay, so some of you are skipping a step here. Like you're already thinking the top zero makes the fraction zero, the bottom zero <laughs> makes it undefined. That's a true <laughs> statement. But this is g, I need g prime. So don't jump over the point here. Let's take a derivative and then we'll worry about where it's zero or undefined. 
Okay, quotient rule. And quotient rule where the overall name of the function is g, so that's kind of a pain. <coughs> Just be careful about the overall function versus what you've sort of relabeled g. Okay, quotient rule gf prime minus fg prime over g squared. gf prime. So 2x times x squared minus 9 minus the other way around 2x times x squared all over the denominator squared. So I'm headed toward where is the top zero, where is the bottom zero, but let's clean up the top. In fact, something kind of nice happens on the top. Do you see what happens in the top that makes our life a little easier? We distribute the 2x, we get 2x cubed minus 2x cubed. And so the only thing left in the top is negative 18x. So there's our derivative. Critical numbers are where g prime is 0 or g prime is undefined. I guess I shouldn't say equals undefined. That's not exactly right. So g prime is 0 when the top equals 0. So we're negative 18x equals 0. So x equals 0. I guess I wouldn't say that's half of my critical numbers. That's half of the process, right? That's the, the top half. The bottom half is undefined when the bottom equals 0. So x squared minus 9 squared equals 0. Now, you can go through the steps to solve for that, but it would be great if you could just look at that and think, well, what values of x would make all this thing 0? Plus or minus 3. If I square 3, I get 9, and then it's all zeros from there. So plus or minus 3. So those are my critical numbers. Sometimes the top is 0, sometimes the bottom is 0. Um, we don't yet know how to get to see if those critical numbers are relative extrema. We're only asking for critical numbers on this problem. Number 2. Find all the critical numbers or h of x equals sine of x. So, or excuse me, h of x equals e to the x sine of x. Same type problem. I need a derivative. Um, oh, last one was quotient rule. This one is product rule. So first times derivative of the second plus second times derivative of the first. What's the derivative of e to the x? e to the x. So I'm going to factor out an e to the x, cosine of x plus sine of x. Uh, critical numbers is where h prime is 0 or h prime undefined. Thank you. Um, so let's set it equal to 0. It's never going to be undefined. I don't have any denominators to worry about. So either the first thing is 0 or the second thing is 0. <coughs> um, where's e to the x equals 0? Hint, trick question. Right, so I mean, maybe your brain starts thinking, okay, if I plug in 0, whoops, I get 1. If I plug in something negative, it flips it over, but it never gets 0. So no solution, or no solution to that part of the problem. Okay, how about where cosine of x plus sine of x equals 0? <coughs> that takes a little bit of thought. Sort of as we're playing with it. There's some algebra ways to do it, and there's some figured out ways to do it. Sine of x needs to equal negative cosine of x. 
So they need to be different signs, right? Yeah, if I'm going to add them together to be 0, they need to have different signs. What quadrants do sine and cosine have a different sign in? They're both positive in 1, so that wouldn't work. They're both negative in 3, so that's out. So I've got to come from 2 and 4. And then where are their values? Forget the negatives. Where are their values the same? Yeah, the over 4s. That's a good initial answer anyway. So over 4 in the second is 3 pi over 4. Over 4 in the fourth is 7 pi over 4. That would make my derivative 0. If the derivative is 0, it's a critical number, and it might be a relative max or min, but I don't really know yet. Need more information. All right, this page, the top third of this page, I think is, if you understand what a derivative is, I think is easy can't say that very often in calculus, but definition of increasing and decreasing intervals. Okay, a lot of letters, a lot of technical jargon in here. Let's read carefully and see if we can understand what it's saying. A function f is increasing, okay, it's like going up, left to right, on an interval if f of b is bigger than f of a when b is bigger than a. So that means b is bigger than a and f of b is bigger than f of a, uh, yeah, so that's that would be increasing. So we, sometimes we put these technical definitions on, and you you read them, and you make sense of them. You're like, oh, well, yeah, that's that's what increasing means, going <coughs> up. Got it. Did, why did we have to put all this technical jargon on there? Um, if it's true for every single spot, we say it's strictly increasing. That rarely matters in here honestly. Like later in math life, um, strictly increasing has inverses and the, we're not worried about that. Function is decreasing. You know what decreasing means. It means it's going down. f of b is less than f of a when b is bigger than a. So as you move left to right, you're going down. All right. So like, I don't know. That's why we didn't even start that. Like, yeah, that that's just, that makes sense. It's almost like this should have the biggest star on the page, this next two lines here. What can you say about the derivative of f when f is increasing? So if I got my function and it's increasing, what would you say about f prime? What would you say about the derivative if f is increasing? It's positive. F prime is positive. When F is decreasing, we would say F prime is negative. All right, F prime, the derivative, that's the slope. So if slope is negative, then it's going down. If the slope is positive, then the function is going up. That's sort of the basis for the rest of the day. If that makes sense, then you'll be good for the rest of the day. All right, the test for increasing and decreasing intervals. Well, this, this, this is like what we just said. F is increasing if F prime is positive. F is decreasing if F prime is negative. Uh, we're going to, well, a function can be increasing or decreasing in when, even when the derivative is undefined. So this is a little bit weird here. At that particular spot, f prime is undefined because it's vertical, <coughs> but it's still increasing. Number one, on what intervals, if any, is g of x decreasing? Justify your answer. OK, a couple of comments about justify your answer here. Um, number one, it means, it means more than just show your work. It means that, but it means more than that. Like usually in math class when we say justify your answer, we just mean like, 
don't just tell me what the answer is. Like, show the process. Here it means that, but it means a little bit more than that. It means give a calculus reason. Meaning you're probably going to say something about f prime or f double prime or the antiderivative, but we haven't done most of those things yet. So almost all your justifies so far are going to be first derivative because that's about all we do so far. And then lastly, this is a personal preference that I think helps get the problem right. It may seem backwards, but I like to justify first. Because if you do that, uh, it sort of provides the roadmap for the problem. So think about what your justification would be first, and then that tells you what to do to get your answer. Okay, if you try to justify last, well then you've already done you've already done what you need to do. Think about the justify first, that will help you know what to do for the problem. Okay, so on what intervals is g decreasing? Let's justify <laughs> first. So let's give a reason here. G is decreasing when. So how do I know if g is decreasing? Give me a calculus based answer. What's that, Lindsay? Yes, although this one's G, so I'm going to say G prime. There's my justify. Right? Justify doesn't mean like write a paragraph or give me an essay. Like, no, it just means give me a calculus reason for why G is decreasing. Well, G is decreasing when G prime is negative. Now I know what to look for in this problem. I just want to know where G prime is negative, and I've already justified. Also, there's partial credit for that. Right? Like that's that's part of the answer. So even if you don't know how to take a derivative or you mess up on the derivative, you're still going to get some points because you gave me a good calculus justification even if you mess up the rest of the way. All right, g prime, that would be negative 9x squared plus 6x. And I want to know where that is negative. So I want to know where, uh, well, let's factor it. So I'm going to take out a negative 3x. That would leave me 3x minus 2. And I want to know where that is less than 0. Uh, inequalities. We're doing these right now in pre-cal. So we'll find our zeros, put them on the number line, test the intervals. Does that sound familiar? Like, uh, maybe. Vaguely. So x equals 0, that would be from the first thing, from the first factor. From the second factor, x equals 2 thirds. So I need a number line with 0 and 2 thirds on it. There's really not enough space to do what I want to do. You know what? We're going to skip number 2 anyway. So mark it out and we'll put our number line down here. 0, 2 thirds. So I want to test the intervals. Um, ooh, I don't have very many good options here. I'm either testing a negative number or testing 1 third. I think I just want to test 1. That seems like it would be the easiest thing to test. Testing it into G prime. I want to know if G prime is positive or negative. So that would be negative 9 times 1 squared plus 6. <coughs> and I want to know if that's less than 0. So that would be negative 3 is less than 0. That's true. So I would I am gonna shade that region. That means g prime is is negative there. <coughs> Do you remember how I can find the other intervals without actually testing one third or negative one? Yeah, they alternate. So we're pressed for time today. We'll trust the alternating rule. So if it's negative on that interval, it's positive on this interval and negative on this interval. Or it was a yes over here, a no in the middle, and a yes on that end.
And if g prime is negative, that tells me that g is decreasing. <coughs> g prime positive tells me that g is increasing. g prime negative means that g is decreasing. You don't need to write all of this stuff, but I'm trying to make those connections. So the answer is, or the question was, where is g decreasing? Well, g is decreasing from negative infinity up to 0 and from 2 thirds to infinity. And we already justified, like, because that's where g prime is negative. So I don't have to say that again. Be careful. If you didn't say it at the beginning, you would need to say it here. But I like to justify first because that sort of tells me how to do the problem. We marked out number two, but it works the same way. Like you would take a derivative and look for where the derivative is positive since it's increasing. All right, relative extrema. So this is where we try to make the connection. How do I get from critical numbers to relative extrema? So like that, that Venn diagram, like all my relative extrema are critical numbers. So I find my critical numbers, and then how do I get that into, how do I know which ones are relative extrema? Well, visually, it's easy to see, right? It's like, well, the tops are the relative maximum. <coughs> the bottoms are the relative minimums. Got it. But if we don't have a graph, then it's a little bit harder to tell what's going on. A relative maximum is a point where the function changes from increasing to decreasing. The function changes from increasing to decreasing. Yeah, that's a relative maximum. These are statements where you don't memorize these statements. You understand what they're saying, and then hopefully it's just like, yeah, that of course that's right. A relative minimum is where the function changes from decreasing to increasing. Look at the point a comma f of a. This point over here. What is f prime at a? So what's the slope at that point? Zero. The sine of f prime, OK, so be careful. The sine of the derivative changes from, what's the sine of the derivative over on this side? <coughs> positive, and on the other side, it's negative. Look at point B. F prime of B, also 0. The sine of F prime changes from, let's see on the left side, we're going down, so that's negative to positive. Again, those aren't memorized things. Those are, think about it, figure it out. We said previously that a corner or cusp can be a relative extrema. In the above graph, the corner is a relative minimum. Yes. Does the sine of f prime change from negative to positive there? So at this point, we said with c, does f prime change from negative to positive? What's the slope on this side? What's the slope on this side? We're going down. That slope's negative. What's the slope on this side? Positive. So yes. So the rule still applies even at cusp. If f prime changes, then you've got a, either a max or a min. The first derivative test, like this is starred, but this is not starred to memorize. It's starred to understand. Jump down to the bullet points. If f prime changes from negative to positive, f prime changes from negative to positive, well, then you've got a relative minimum. f prime changes from positive to negative, well, then you've got a relative maximum. If f prime is negative on both sides or positive on both sides, so like negative, negative, or positive, positive, 
then f of c is not a max or a min. Right? Well, yeah, if it stays decreasing or stays increasing, then that's not a max or a min. It's like a whole lot of words today to come up with some conclusions that's like, if you know what slope means and you know that derivative means slope, then yeah, we got a relative minimum if we change from negative to positive. Let's see if we can squeeze one example in. Probably not. Find all the relative extrema for this function. Designate whether it's a max or a min. So first job is to get the critical points. F prime is 4x cubed minus 32. Critical points are where f prime is 0 or undefined. No, it's not undefined anywhere, but it's 0. What value of x would make that f prime equal to 0? Move the 8 over, cube root both sides, so x equals 2. And then let's set up a chart with, or a, a number line with 2. And then we'll check either side, and that will tell us increasing or decreasing. So I'm going to check 0 and check 3, although I probably don't even need to check 3 because I can do the alternating thing. So let's see, 4 times 0 cubed minus 32. That would be negative 32. That tells me that f prime is negative. What does that tell me about f? If f prime is negative, then what is f doing? Decreasing. If I plug in three, um, I know it's going to be. I know it's going to flip. But four times twenty-seven minus thirty-two. I don't know what that is, but it's definitely positive. Okay, so if f prime goes from negative, means f is decreasing, to f prime positive, then what's going on at x equals two? x equals 2 is a relative minimum because f prime changes. And now just like look at your picture from negative to positive. Don't go memorizing hardly anything we said today. Think about what slope and derivative means. And if it changes, it either changes to make a minimum or it changes to make a maximum. And your number line and pictures tell the story of which one it's doing. All right, so attempts worksheet number two, or at least some of it, we'll look at it more when we get back on Monday. <coughs>